It is now my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who saved the best for last. He, he says, he says. <laughs> he specializes in making sense and fun out of economics. He's the chief economist for Graphs and Laughs, an aptly named company. He is an internationally acclaimed economics and public speaker and the former senior economist with the National Association of Home Builders in Washington, which brings up a key point we're accustomed to referring to our next guest as being from Washington. I'm here to tell you that he's now from Florida. Florida's bigger. He, uh, he now resides in Miami and his research and opinions have been featured in Bloomberg, Businessweek, Forbes, Fortune, and many other publications. And I'm also told that his daily 70 word commentary on the economy, which is available online and the price is very reasonable. Am I right? Zero. And I'm told that it's really the bomb. So you might want to check that out. Uh, please welcome presenting the topic we all want to hear about, the, well, maybe we might not want to hear about, the economy in 2022, growing but slowing, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Elliot Eisenberg. My, whoa, whoa. my gosh, it's a pleasure to be here. Wow, it's a pleasure to be here for I don't know how many reasons. It's a, it's a, it's a live audience. There's lots to talk about and so on. So let's, let's get going. Look, I want to begin this by telling you, look, the economy is OK. This is the single most important thing. Yeah, yeah, you know, there's, there's Delta variant and GDP in Q2 only grew at 6.5%, not 8.5%. We would have liked better. Uh, so there's this problem and that problem. Look, look, every day we're all a day closer to dying. But <laughs> I don't focus on this and say, oh, my God, I'm going to die a day sooner. Let's, my, my day's ruined. No, the day is good. I'm healthy. We're doing fine. This is the... This is the way I want you to think about the economy. Yeah, yeah, there were problems. Nothing's perfect. Yes, there's some inflation out there. We'll talk about it. Things aren't going quite as fast as we'd like. Delta variants come back with some, some semblance of vengeance. Just take it with a grain of salt, really, a grain of salt. So let's begin. And oh, oh, this is wrong. Here you go. Look, the economy, as I say, is improving. We're going to have above trend growth this year. We're going to have above trend growth next year. It may not be as much as we'd like, but look, it's still pretty damn good. The economy is like getting like a B plus, right? It's better to get an A or an A minus, but a B plus is pretty good. I, a lot of you, I'm sure, graduated college with a C, right? And you still, you still, you still did okay. So don't worry. Right, the GDP is composed of four terms: C, household consumption; I, corporate investment; G, government spending; and the term in brackets is net exports. Household consumption has been very good. We've been spending our brains out mostly on stuff, and now we're transitioning to services as opposed to goods, and that's going to have some implications for housing, which we'll get into. The second term is I, corporate investment. Firms aren't investing in plant because no one knows what plant they need to invest in. Are we going to need this? What's the new normal post-COVID normal going to look like? Do I need to make more hand sanitizer? People are going to come back to work. We're going to have corporate travel. How about logistics? Frozen food. Are we going to deliver food? I don't know. So firms are investing in stuff. We'll talk about that. Government spending has been crazy stimulative until recently, right? Stimulus checks, this, huge budget deficits, but not going forward. The deficit in 2020 was about 3.2 trillion bucks. The deficit in 2021 is going to turn out to be about 3.1 trillion bucks or 3 trillion bucks. And then 22 is going to fall to one and a half trillion bucks. So there's going to be a huge decline. It's going to be an economic drag on our economy. So the, the, the Biden money that's kind of start coming because of the American families plan and jobs plan that I'll talk about in some detail is kind of convenient. It's not all bad. And the last term exports minus imports, it doesn't really matter all that much. But it's been mildly negative. Why has it been negative? It's been negative because Europe and Japan and Canada and other Australia, they have been growing more slowly than us because we've been much more stimulative policies than they have been. And because our economy grows faster, we're sucking imports from them and they're not sucking imports from us. So the, de the detriment is it hurts our trade deficit. The benefit of this is that it lessens inflation. Because had we not been able to import the stuff from Europe and Canada and uh, Mexico and uh, Australia, there'd be less of whatever it is we want to buy. And that would jack up inflation, make it e making it even worse. So in economics, there's never a free lunch. The cost, worse trade deficit, the advantage, a little lower inflation. 
So this is, this is a pretty good story. Is it going as fast as I'd like? No. Is it going to go in the future as fast as I'd like? Probably not. But it's still going to grow above trend, and we're still growing well. So just, just, just relax. Enjoy it. It's important. So this is, I think, the perfect example with everything wrong with our economy auto sales. The recession ends, right? Auto sales, they plummet. You can see here, they're, they're in the garbage can here, 8 million, 9 million units. It improves. It then gets better, 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 better. Whoa, awesome. And then the bottom friggin' falls out. And you go like, WTF? <laughs> How can this be? There's huge demand. You know, no one's working in the office. We're all working at home. So we now need, more, and we're moving to exurbia, suburbia and exurbia. So I'm moving from downtown Chicago to rural Naples somewhere. I need four cars. I got to have a beach car and an office car and a home car and a car for the kids. And you can't get the cars. Why not? It isn't that they don't want to make the cars, that they can't get parts for the car. They can't get pieces, the, the chips. Yeah, someone said chips. You want to come up here? We can do it together. It's, but we need chips. You said it. We need chips. Yeah, we'll sit down together. We'll be okay. We'll be a team. Come on up. Just you and I, we're going to have a conversation. Ignore them. It's just you and I. So we can't get chips. When's this going to end? This, this is a serious problem. This problem will last for a very long time because you can't make more chips. Not so easy. You have to build a fabrication plant. Fabrication plants take years to build. They cost five, 10 billion bucks. And now in three years, we're going to be up to our derrieres in chips because J Japanese are making chips and the South Koreans are making chips, the Taiwanese and the Americans and the Japanese, and the Chinese. We'll have too many. But in between now and then, not enough chips. So this problem of automobiles will be with us for a while. Other problems will go away, but not so much the automobile one. Total sales? Holy cow, this is retail sales. Essentially, this is something you put in your bag and you walk home from a store with or that Amazon can deliver to your house. They've been good. Why? Look at this trend. We have a trend. It's very clear. It should be somewhere around here right now, right? But it's there. So what's going to happen? It's going to come down. You're going to be reading about for the next months. Real retail sales, retail sales went down month over month. They went down year over year. And your response should be, of course, they're going to come down. They're way above because you bought a Peloton for yourself. You bought a Peloton for your husband. You bought a Peloton for your daughter. You bought a Peloton for your ex-wife. Uh, how many more Pelotons? I bought a Weber grill for the outside. I bought a pergola. Yeah, I bought pavers. I bought a sub-zero fridge for outside. I bought a TV set for outside. I bought a pool for outside. I bought an RV for outside. How much more crap do I need to buy? So it's going to come down. This is a natural process. This isn't good. It isn't bad. It's just a return to some semblance of normalcy, right? This is all fine. This is it. This is it. You see here, this is goods way above trend. That's trend. This is way above. And now it's going to come down. This is services. It's going to go up. This is important. When you bought stuff, you were at home. You were locked in your house. You had nowhere to go. I remember this. I didn't go to the dentist because I was going to get COVID and I was going to die. I didn't go to that barber. No, I had a man on right here. <laughs> I thought it was really, really cool on the side, not in the back, on the side, because I didn't want to go to the barber and die. So you're stuck in your house. You buy all stuff because you're, you're living in your home. You're nesting. You're doing things in your house. But now that goods are going down and services are going up, I'm now going to bars. I'm going to ballet. I'm going to baseball games. I am leaving my house. And you know what? I'm happy about it. I don't want to be in my house. I've been in my house too long. I'm happy to leave. I'm happy to forget about my house. So as sales of services goes up, the, de the thought about nesting and housing goes down a little. So this should all else equal reduce slightly the demand for housing as we go forward because we're going to be out of our damn house. We're not going to think about our house so much. This is fun. This is credit card sales. They're fine. This is through July 22nd. This is July of this year. They're, they're okay. Now, August, okay. It could be a little weaker. Yeah, 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 whatever. This is pretty good numbers. I'm pretty happy with this. Now, this is the golden, terrible story. It's friggin' COVID. And as Powell, chairman of the Fed, always tells us, the economy will go as goes the virus. And it goes on its merry way. And it does its thing. And no one has any friggin' clue why it does what it does. But we do know that in 1918, we had three waves of the virus. And then magically, it went away. It killed like a lot of people. And then mysteriously, it went away. Why? 
Who knows? Did it attack all the people and kill them who they could and the rest were resistant and it went away? I don't know. But what we do know is they come and they go. These waves don't last forever. First wave, second wave, third wave, and we're now in the fourth wave. And you can see it up here. The wave is peaking out. Why? I don't know. No one knows. I've asked all these, these epidemiologists and virologists and they, all, they go, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's because we wear masks. Maybe it's because we wash our hands and then we forget and we get lazy. Maybe it's because, you know, when, the, when it's low here and there and there, we lick doorknobs more or something. I don't know, but it's whatever it is, you know, and they don't understand why it doesn't propagate more when it, when it goes. I mean, why can't it go higher than this? Why can't it get higher? I, but it's going to come down. And you know what? In three months or six months or nine months, there'll be another wave. And the big thing that I stay up and late waiting, thinking, te being terrified about is what if there's a resistant variant that comes, right? Then we're in the crap can because they can make a new drug. That's no problem. You know, Pfizer and Bio, BioNTech and, and, and Johnson and AstraZeneca, they can make a new one. But it may take them two or three months to formulate the thing. And then to get it out to 100 and 300 million Americans and 7 billion people in the world, this takes a weekend or two. So this could be a problem. Do I foresee it? I don't even know. I, I, it, they don't know anything. No one knows. But it's the possible dark backside thing that could happen. But this is going to end now. It's going to go down. We should be better. Fall comes, you know, winter comes, it should be good. We should be, we should be good for the foreseeable future. I'm kind of happy. Then you look at data like this. This is the University of Michigan data. It's, it's, it's good data. They ask the question every two weeks. The survey is very high quality. And you can see here on the far right, it falls out of bed. The data is so bad here. It, it made me go like, like, how can this be? This data literally says, we are more unhappy today than we were last April, May, and June. That is not humanly possible. I mean, is this, is anybody in this room feel worse today than they did in March or April of May of June of 2020? I mean, maybe there's one of you here who has a habit who can't get bought or something, but by and large, you're pretty happy, right? How could, and then, and then moreover, look at the next slide. This is the next slide is the conference board's consumer confidence data. Also a good survey, it's been out for years, really quality data, and it's down a little bit, but not even close to being worse than it was last March, April, right? 18 months ago. So what the hell is going on? Which one's right? The answer, they're both right. Literally, this survey essentially asks questions of people asking, hey, you wanna buy a car and you wanna buy a house? People go, wow, you know, Cars are really expensive. Lawrence Yoon just showed us new car price, used car price up 47% or something, right? So, I don't know. How about a new house? Uh, yeah, you know, it's a kind of, uh, there's no inventory. I can't afford it. Payments are high. I don't think so. So, this one's looking at prices of big ticket items. Well, not surprisingly, it sucks. This one, by contrast, essentially is asking about the quality of the labor market. The labor market has rarely been better than it is today. I want to get into some detail in the labor market, but it's fantastic. So if I ask you, hey, are houses affordably priced right now? You go, I don't think so. And if I asked you, hey, how's the job market? You said, well, I just got 17 job offers last week. You know, I went to a store and, and, and uh, I'm not kidding, a restaurant and the, the, the owner of the restaurant offered people jobs. Hey, you want fries? Hey, how about a job with those fries? I'm not kidding. I, I heard them offer a job to the people in line to buy the food. Yeah. This is as good as it gets, right? So they're happy. So you put it together, not literally put it together, but this is a survey put out by another company. It's Hamilton something, I forgot. HPS hyphen CS, you can, web, you can Google them. And here it's perfect. This is one survey. They ask five questions and you can see some of them are going into the crap can and some are great. This is essentially the conference board questions. These are essentially the University of Michigan questions. Ta-da! So when you see the Michigan survey going into the crap can, don't worry about it. The economy is not following. It's just housing and autos. Not irrelevant to this audience. I get it. <laughs> but don't worry. People are still going to buy houses, right? They're going to sell houses. You know, thank God people have what? Death, 
divorce and disease, the three Ds. That, that, or they call it, sorry, change of circumstance. Is that the word you guys use? It's, yeah, don't use the three Ds, but you get my point. So the economy's fine. Consumer sentiment is decent. It's understandable why it's deteriorated. COVID's come back and things are more expensive. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, whatever. But look at this as other data mobility. This is taking your cell phone and getting directions to go somewhere. It's pretty good. I don't see a real problem here. The US as a whole is in black. And you can see it's gone up, actually. It's fine, thank you. People are doing it. Look, we're here doing this now. Last Sunday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, football, high school, college, pro. The stadiums are full. People are drinking and partying. I'm not sure that's the smartest thing. We can argue. But, you know, people are, are willing to live with COVID. They're willing to take some risk. They're willing to make some compromises and adjustments. They've gotten vaccinated. They're wearing a mask. They're not vaccinated, whatever it is. Yeah, well, the, people are, are living with this. This is the issue. Here's hotels. How good are hotels doing? There are a lot of lines here. So this is the, the 20 the twenty year average is this dark blue line. 2019 is the dotted line. And 2021 is the red line. So what I want to see is the gap between the blue and the purple and the, white, the red, right? I want to see this gap shrinking, 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 shrinking. And then it gets wider again, Shh, crap. So there's been a little bit of deterioration right here. Not a lot. It's down because of seasonality. It's been down that year and that year, right? And this year. So there seems to be a down or this time of year, there's a decline because kids are back in school. We're not going on vacation, right? So the down itself isn't meaningful. What's the meaningful is the gap between where we are and where we were over 20 year average and where we were the year before last. And it's okay. We're generally improving with a little bit of decline. This is gasoline purchases, how much gas we're buying. And it's the same sort of thing. This was the historical trend, right? This is 2020, Jan, Feb, first half of March, then it goes to hell. Then it improves and it sort of bumbles around and it's flat. Now we go into the new year, it's still flat, and then it gets better, 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 and then it goes a little bit down. So the data's going better, better, and then the last little bit, it's gotten a little bit weaker. It hasn't fallen off a cliff. It hasn't gone to hell in a handbasket. It's just a little weaker. This isn't the end of the world. Is it gonna mean slower growth? Yes. Longer to recover jobs? Yes. Slower job growth? Yeah. Okay, I'm not thrilled, but I'm also not sitting here going, oh my God, I have to wear sackcloth and ashes, you know, and mourn. That's a little extreme. This is total consumption, goods and services, inflation adjusted. And this is pretty good data. So here's the trend, right? And just to keep the trend going, it's right where we are. We're back where we should be. We're over consuming on goods. We're under consuming on services. This will switch over time as we continue to go out to restaurants and bars and movie theaters and stuff and buy less, fewer Pelotons and Weber grills and so on. But we're roughly on target. Uh, is it true that government spending, you know, money going, stimmy money, unemployment checks are going to decline? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But now they're going to have child support money that's going to come and we're going to have job growth that comes. So there are compensating factors. This is not a one way street. Income is not all going down. And we'll, we'll come back to the income theme a little bit later on the inflation topic. So this is OK, too. This is manufacturing. Manufacturers are happy out of their minds. I don't understand quite why. I'll be very honest with you. They can't get labor. They can't get parts. They can't get input. They can't get drivers of trucks. They can't get drivers of ship, ship captains. They can't get engineers for trains. They can't get people to unload the containers in the ships. The ships are backing up. I don't know. What, I mean, these guys literally must snort or line a Coke every day to be this happy, given all the impediments that they face on a regular basis. I don't understand why they're this happy. What they do know is they can sell everything that they make. Whatever it is that goes out that door will be sold instantly because there's just there's pleasant pent up demand for stuff and we can't meet it, right? So this is manufacturing. Like this is a, this is services. So this is bars and restaurants, and you can see it quickly goes way up. And then COVID, this new wave of COVID comes and it comes down. Fifty is neutral here. Fifty, as long as you're above fifty, you're growing. We're still comfortably growing. 
Another data piece came out on services today. This is from market. Another one came out today. It's much higher, down also, but higher. So again, you see deterioration here. You see deterioration, oops, wrong direction. You see deterioration there. There is clearly deterioration. But again, it's measured, it's limited. We can argue how material it is if you're a lawyer. Yeah, it's sort of material, but not exactly, right? So it's a little bit of weakening. Am I sitting here? I'm not crying in my beer. I'd like a beer, but you know, we're, we're okay. This is small business sentiments. This is, this is uh, NFIB. I think someone may have mentioned it earlier. Was it you, Brad, or did, did Lawrence? Someone mentioned it, I think. They asked, how do you feel? This survey has some pros and cons to it. The pro is it's small business. You guys are small business, right? So this clearly is picking up your general sentiment. The problem is this survey has become, to some extent, a political Rorschach test. And when Trump won, it skyrockets. And when Biden won, it went down. Now, that clearly is not economic conditions instantly changing here either, right? So this survey is not quite as useful as it was to me because I'm afraid it's gotten a little bit contaminated here with politics, like a lot of things have. But the thing is, is it down a little bit of late? It is also down a little bit of late. So clearly across the board, there's a bit of deterioration. It's not a tragedy. This, this is the problem with our economy. There's nothing in the friggin' store. You know, I read articles about what it was like in the Soviet Union when they had no food in the store, right? And they had just like olives. That's all they had one month or like socks or something. And the rest of the store was completely empty. This is what I feel like this is because this is retail inventory to sales ratio. Forget what the inventory to sales ratio means. I don't even care. It's meaningless. I'm an economist. I don't even worry. I look at the trend and say, look, it's between 1.4 and 1.5. That's where it lives. This has been since 2013, even before. It's a little bit lower, but 1.4, in a recession, it went up fine because suddenly no one was buying things. We bounce along. We're happy. We're happy. We're happy. Then we go into recession. No one buys anything. The inventory ratio skyrockets. And then it friggin' completely collapses because you can't get a ship, you can't get a plane, you can't get a train, you can't get parts, you can't get labor, you can't get raw materials. I heard an interview with a guy, the CEO of like Post Serial or something. He said, yeah, we can't get boxes, we can't get flour, we can't get trucks to transport the stuff. What else is there that they're selling? I ask home builders, they tell me every single thing in the house, like a bag of nails, more expensive. A window, more expensive. Two by fours, way more expensive than cheaper. You know, it goes on and on. Then one guy told me, oh yeah, we got a book from, the, from our supply house of the cost of the items to buy for the, for the house. They mail us the book. And then four days later, they, they send us an email saying, every price in the book is wrong, add 5%. I'm not making, you can't make this. It's too stupid to make up. But it's true. This is the serious problem. And this is inflationary. There is no doubt when you can't get anything, it's inflationary, right? Because whatever you want to get, you can't get it. It's more expensive as a result. We're going to come back to this too, right? Look here. This is it. There are more friggin' ships off the port of LA Long Beach, which is a single, it's not one port, it's two, but it's the biggest port in the US. A third of all imports come to LA Long Beach because they're coming from Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, and China, right? There are more friggin' ships backed up now than there were in the worst of the times back in January. So the cost of the ship, way up. The cost of a container to, to ship stuff is way more expensive because the, the containers are all stuck on the ships. And they're not just stuck here, they're stuck in Rotterdam and they're stuck in Antwerp and they're stuck in Tokyo and they're stuck in China. They're stuck all because the longshoremen have COVID and no one's unloading a ship. So that's why the cereal costs more money. And this is just, just, just crazy. We'll get into why. I'm, here, this is the cost of a friggin' ship. This is the index price. So a couple of years ago, 2015, 2016, normal times on the far left, the index value was 1,000. Right now, it's four and a half thousand. The cost to rent a ship to go cross the cross ocean, not the cross country. That'll be bad, but you get my point. Across eight, you know, the Atlantic, the Pacific. This is for dry stuff. So you're moving soybeans or corn or wheat or iron ore, something like that. The price is more than quadrupled in no time flat. A year ago, it was here at five hundred. It's now nine times as expensive to rent a ship as it was a year ago. 
This is all going into the cost of goods. And it's part because you can't get the goods and you can't get the ship. And they can't build ships fast if you think, well, they'd be building lots of ships, but they can't get supplies, they can't get people, they can't get inputs. They get the same problem. The ship builders in Japan and Taiwan, uh, Japan, South Korea, and China, they can't make ships fast enough either. So this is, everything's more expensive because our economy's whacked out. Okay, why is our economy whacked out? It's whacked out because normally, in their normal conditions, when you enter, when you exit a recession, demand and supply, they kind of go up together but not now. Now, demand is here and supply is here. And demand is here and supply is here. There's this big yawning gap. We're ready to do all this stuff. We want to spend and consume and do, but we can't get people to make and service. That's the problem. We'll get into why a little bit later on, but that's the problem we have. Here's capacity utilization. You would think under these conditions with infinite demand for stuff and producers can make and sell whatever, sell whatever they make, you think firms would be working 24 by seven, right? right? No, no. The auto, automakers have closed down assembly lines because they can't get parts and they aren't the only ones. Other ones are too. So right now on the very far right, capacity utilization is actually less than it was before the recession began, right? You see that there? And what's interesting about that is right before the recession began, capacity utilization sucked because you can see it here, right? You can see right there, it went down like a, like, it went dropped like a rock falling off a cliff, why? If you remember Trump imposed, President Trump imposed tariffs on the Chinese. So what did the Chinese do in response? They retaliated, I know it's shocking, it's unbelievable. You could never have thought that up, but they did. So there was less trade between us and China and China and us, right? So manufacturing took it on the chin. Manufacturing was essentially, on the verge of a recession back in 19. And we haven't even gotten back to where we were at that near recessionary level before COVID hit us. So manufacturers happy, but they're not making much stuff because they can't get parts, labor inputs. We've gone through this list before. How about, but, but what have firms done instead? Ooh, they're buying capital goods. Whoa, they're buying like software. Why? Because you can get software. You can't hire a person, no one's to hire, right? You can't get stuff, let's hire software to do work for us. Let's buy a robot that makes hamburgers or something. I'm not making it up, it's a one-armed hamburger maker. But let's do other things to compensate for the fact that we can't get inputs and can't get the ship and can't get the drivers and can't get the engineers and can't get the flatbed trucks and can't get the supplies. We'll do what we can, that's now. Now, you're going to read very soon, not only are retail sales gonna start going down, because we explained that already. Now you're gonna hear capital goods orders are peaking out and they're gonna to start to go down too. It's enough to make you think that the economy is going into the handbasket, but it's not because this can't go up for either, forever either. You know, you've bought the robot, you bought the software, you bought this, you bought a computer, whatever you can buy to compensate for not getting what you really want, you're compensating, but then you've compensated enough and you've done compensating. You can't buy any more of whatever it is to compensate for what you can't have anymore. And you're done compensating. And then it naturally dribbles down or stops going up or something. This is just because of the crazy economy that we're in. This is a sign of ridiculousness. This shouldn't be happening. We should be hiring more people and doing what we normally do. But because we can't, this is the next best alternative. And that's the way it is. On the good news front, oil prices are up. I'm not exactly thrilled paying three bucks a gallon for gas. But at three bucks, I'm not exactly bitching. Right? At four bucks, I'm really bitching. At two bucks, I'm celebrating, right? Three bucks, yeah, it's okay. So three bucks is good. You see here, this is exploration and production. So the number of rigs being used to drill holes in the ground is going up pleasantly. I'd like it to go up a little bit more. It's never going to return to what it was there or there. Interestingly enough, it was 900 at the peak, this recent peak. If you go back five or six or seven years, it was at 17 or 1800. And they learn to produce more oil with fewer rigs. I'll just tell you one quick, three quick things. One, they can now drill down two miles down, not a mile. They can drill miles wide this way. And the rigs themselves, they move. So they drill and they move the rig and they drill and they move the rig and they drill. 
and they move the rig and they drill. You don't need so many rigs if you can, the rig can physically walk to the next place to drill. The technological innovations going on here are astounding. The key thing is it's going up and US production is going up. It's all very good. This is a good thing. I'm happy about this. And corporate profits are friggin' out of control, right? So if you own stock, raise your hands, you're happy. You own bonds, raise your hands, you're happy. You own a house, raise your hands, you're happy. You own some other assets of some kind, raise your hands. You own anything. This is the anything rally. You own a pair of socks, you're probably rich, you can retire. A friend of mine owns a business. He was telling me, you know, I bought a car last year, a couple of cars for the business. I don't like the cars, he said to me. There's something wrong. It is not convenient. I bought four of them. I got like 15,000 miles on each of these cars. I said, just sell them. He said, I can't. I'll lose money. I said, no, no, you don't understand. There are no cars now. You'll make a fortune. You can sell the car that you bought last year that now has 15,000 miles on it and make money. He said, no. I said, yes. He, he called the place up. And sure enough, he took me to dinner. That was my reward. Okay, whatever. <laughs> I undercharge, but the point is, you know, you own anything, you own a mask, you're rich, it's crazy. So corporate profits are phenomenal. This is very helpful for housing. Share buybacks are probably gonna break a record, break the record for, 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 for that was set in 2018, right? If not, it'd be really close. This is the first nine months or whatever it is, right? Eight months or something through August 10th or whatever it is. This is really good numbers, right? The economy is doing pretty good. These firms, look, GDP is now higher than it was before the recession began. Employment is still 5.3 or 5.4 million below what it was. We've learned to do more, literally, with less. We figured it out. What's your name again? Rick. So I, I, Rick used to work for me. And then, I, you know, things were bad. I had a restaurant. I wasn't essential. I had to fire everybody. And I brought you back and you back and you back. And I forgot about Rick. I'm sorry. And then next thing you knew, the restaurant's doing great. And I forgot about Rick. And I realized, you know what? You're nice. You're funny. You tell good jokes. You're good looking. But you don't add anything to the restaurant. I didn't bring you back. I'm really sorry. This happened all over the country. We learned as employers that we don't need all the employees. And the employees learned that they don't need the jobs. It goes both ways. We'll talk about this more. But a lot of workers realize they don't want to do the work they used to do either. And that's part of the problem in our labor markets right now. But corporate profits, they're friggin' amazing, right? They're great. So the stock market psh, keeps going up. I don't know how much longer. I'm not a stock market expert. No one's a stock market expert. Stock market makes fools out of every one of us, right? But do I feel a little uncomfortable? Yeah. Do I think that maybe over the next 10 years, the stock market won't do as well as it has over the last 10 years? Yeah, I really do. I think that's probably a good way to think about it. Maybe we got 10% return the last 10 years on average, year over year growth. Maybe it'll be five or four or six over the next 10 years. I think if you have that attitude, you'll be okay. The market could drop 20% next week. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Could happen. Who knows what it does? This for you is important. Household balance sheets are spectacular because this is the everything rally. You own Bitcoin, you're happy. You own Dogecoin, which isn't even a real thing, you're happy. You know, Ethereum, you know, whatever. There's 11,000 11, cryptocurrencies out there. All 11,000 I checked yesterday, they're all up, every one. Okay, maybe online. But look, this is the recession. It lasted a month, two months. This is from late Feb to late March. The stock market fell a huge amount, like 10 or 15 trillion bucks was wiped out of net worth. And then, whoa, baby, let it rip. That's why we're buying houses. We saved money, we weren't going anywhere. So we saved 10 or 20,000 bucks over the year. I had people call me up. Hey, Ellie, you know, I used to hang out with my friends. I, my relatives would come, family, they'd go out to dinner. But now I'm not seeing anybody. And we ended up saving 25,000 bucks. Rick probably saved more because he wasn't, didn't, had, didn't have a job, right? Yeah. But, you know, we saved money. And then forced savings, the stock market, the bond market, the housing market, the auto market, everything goes up. And suddenly we have lots of money to spend on houses. The money we saved and the government money that we got helped us make a down payment in many cases. That drove first time home buyers into the housing market. They had good income, but no wealth. Well, now they suddenly had wealth because they saved up 20 or 30 thou, right? This is unbelievable. As long as the housing market stays up, this is a great story. My, if, I, if I gave you a fear, it would be the stock market goes down, 
hurts consumer confidence, consumer comp, consumers stop buying things, and you have a traditional recession. Lack of confidence, things go bad. Could it happen? Sure. Do I think it will? No. The Fed's really concerned about not making things a mess in financial markets. They don't want to supply finance, surprise financial markets, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But this is terrific. And this is in part, as I mentioned earlier, because of savings. And if I kick myself about anything I missed as an economist in this entire recession, it's this. When the recession began and we were locked in our homes, I should have realized right away there's going to be a staggering amount of forced savings because there's nowhere to go. Who wants to go to a bar and you meet some good looking man or an attractive woman and you want to buy them a drink and you go, mm -hmm. <laughs> it cost me $35 for the privilege. I don't think so. So you don't go and you don't do anything. So there's this force and this force savings is what drove a lot of stuff off. Now, let's decompose this graph. The point here is savings was about seven and a half percent of disposable income after tax income, right? It skyrockets because we get stimmy money. It goes down. It goes up because we get more stimmy money. It goes down. It goes up again because we get more stimmy money, and then it comes down. And now it's coming back to normal. I think it comes back to where it was, but maybe it ends up hanging up a little higher. I don't have the answer to this, but I think about this because I have a warped mind. You think about useful things. I think about this. But kidding aside, imagine you're 30 years old. 12 years ago, you went through the, the, the global financial crisis. You saw your parents lose the house or whatever it is, right? And then 10, 12 years later, you have this. Is this changing your view of the world and how much you should save? Maybe I should save an extra 500 bucks a month or 3,000 a year or whatever it is. So if we save more, this will be deflationary. There's no question, right? I don't know the answer, but we're coming back to some semblance of a new post-COVID hopefully post-COVID normal here, whatever it represents. But it's coming down because we're returning to, you know, sales of goods are coming down because we're coming back to normal. Sales of services are going up because we're returning to normal. Savings rates are coming down because we're returning to normal. So growth is a little slower than we'd like as we slowly transition back to normal. This is bankruptcy. This is nuts. This is plainly nuts. If you look at this graph, you see two really bizarre things. 2020, the year of the great phenomenal, great lockdown, and bankruptcy collapses. We lose our jobs. 22 and a half million Americans lose their job. We'll get into that in some detail. And yet bankruptcy goes down. The other thing you notice, because I am a genius economist and you're not. So I zeroed in on this really fast. I bet you completely missed this. Wow, it's lower than 2006. And I look at this graph and I go, what the hell happened in 2006? Anybody have an idea? The answer is there was regime change in 2006. So in 2005, Congress passed a law making it more difficult to declare bankruptcy. So when that law was being passed, what did the lawyers in the world do? They put a big billboard saying, it will be difficult to declare bankruptcy next year, next billboard, do it now. So there was pent up demand for bankruptcy created in 2005 because it was going to be harder to do it in six. But yet this year, last year, it's lower than it was in the super low year of 2006. Then the housing bust comes and everyone declares bankruptcy and the law did no good, but that's a whole separate conversation. So is there gonna be pent up demand for bankruptcy now? Of course, sure. Some people are gonna get foreclosed on, some businesses are gonna go under. Do I see this as a big problem? No, it's kind of like forbearance. It's a problem a little bit, but it'll go back to what it was before. Maybe it'll com compensate and go a little bit higher, but nothing particularly meaningful. Why was it so low? If you had a mortgage, ah, don't bother, don't pay, it's okay. How you have rent payment? Ah, don't bother, it's okay. If you have a student loan, ah, pay it later, it's later, it's okay, it's fine. Well, if you don't have a rent payment, a student loan payment and a mortgage payment, suddenly it's very hard to go bankrupt. What else can you not pay? Oh, student loans, don't pay those either. Yeah, you're set. I mean, no bills, no bankruptcy, right? It's pretty simple. Then now comes this. So now Biden's the president and he has two ideas. The, 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 the beige color here and the, like the schnoz green color here. So this one is hard infrastructure on the left. This one is soft infrastructure. This one is, is roads, bridges, ports, and broadband. 
Uh, Dr. Yoon, Lawrence talked about this one. They're gonna have a G fee increase to help pay for some of this. This one is going to be roughly a trillion dollars. This one is bipartisan. Democrats and Republicans passed it out of the House and it will eventually pass, uh, the Senate passed. It will eventually pass the House, I presume, but things still could go wrong. It's Washington, nothing's guaranteed until it's turned into law. This, by contrast, is going to be a purely partisan effort. The Republicans don't want anything to do with this and they're gonna try and kill it. The Democrats are gonna try and pass it on a, using a process called reconciliation. I'm not gonna go into detail as to what that means, but reconciliation is Washingtonese or is English for that to the other party. Because you don't need the other party if you invoke reconciliation. I could use some stronger words, but I won't. So it's, it's basically screw you, we don't need you, we're gonna do it ourselves. But there's a catch. The Democrats have exactly 50 seats in the Senate. The Republicans have 50 seats in the Senate. So for the Democrats to pass a bill out of the Senate, they have to have all 50 senators say yes. And then the vice president, Kamala Harris, comes in and breaks the tie and the bill moves to the House. The Democrats have a razor thin majority of like four seats. But just this week, or is it last week? I think this week, uh, last week, Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia, a state that voted for the second most Republican state in the entire country, has a Democratic senator, which is quite in and of itself remarkable. Manchin is a, is a dinosaur. And I say this in a very positive light for him. He has managed to, the second most Republican state in the country, he is one of the two senators. Democrats beat on him. I'm going off the rails here, I know. Democrats beat on him senselessly. They have no idea. They're just crazy people. You should be, if you're Democrat, you should be, you should be kissing his feet because this guy is winning a state that he has no business winning. And if he has to cause trouble in some ways because he's of his constituents, just go with him and don't be angry with him, right? Uh, uh, if you're a Republican, you're just angry at Trump for blowing, blowing Georgia because Georgia, the Republican should have kept at least one of those two seats in the runoff election. But that's how politics go. So back to our story. A trillion dollars here. Let's suppose this passes for two trillion dollars, not three and a half trillion bucks. That's three trillion bucks. That's big money, right? Raise your hands if you think it's big money. But it's not. It's not. Here's why. You're used to, you know, by Trump signed last March, April, two trillion dollar stimulus package, right? And then Trump in December, lame duck session, he signed another five hundred billion dollars of stimulus package. And then Biden in March, April signed another $2 trillion of stimulus package. You go, whoa, that's $5 trillion bucks. Here's three more. Whoa. Yeah, no, no, no. This is completely different. That was money literally going out the door when the, pat when the law was signed. So you're getting $2 trillion out the door or $500 billion out the door or $2.1 or $1.9 trillion out the door. It was very fast out. It was either spent, saved, turned into Bitcoin, Robinhood, whatever it was, right? GameStop, mem, mem, mem stocks, whatever. This is over a decade. So three trillion over a decade, a non-trivial amount of money. The question becomes, is this in and of itself going to be inflationary? That's three trillion bucks. And the answer is, I don't see how this can be inflationary. Here's why. This is going to raise the amount of money that government spends in our economy by an entire percentage point. So government spending will increase from 21 to 22 or from 22 to 23, whatever the number is. This is a major change. I'm not belittling this. This is a very, relatively speaking, this is a big deal of how our economy will operate and how big government will be compared to the private sector and so on. It matters. But over a 10 year period, US GDP adds up over a decade to ballpark $300 trillion. This is 3 trillion bucks. It's 1% of GDP. Again, 1% is not trivial, don't get me wrong. But you can't tell me that our economy will have massive inflationary bias because of a rearranging of 1%. Moreover, about two thirds of this is gonna be paid for with taxes. So there's not gonna be that much stimulative effect from this. There'll be some, and we can argue whether this is good policy or not, an entirely separate conversation that I'm not gonna go on to here. But this cannot possibly be that stimulative because it's largely paid for and it just friggin' isn't that big over a decade, right? And moreover, in the short run, as I mentioned earlier, government spending is going to be contractionary. 
fiscal policy will be contractionary because we're not gonna get the stimmy money anymore. It's going to go away. All this government largesse is largely ending. So picking up a little bit of this in 22 and 23 because of this new policies, because of these new bills, is in and of itself probably not a half bad idea. It mitigates against the massive contractionary fiscal policy that we might accidentally slip into, right? Not so bad. If you put all of this together, this is what our economy looks like. Prior, this was, this was the global financial crisis or the housing bust. We, we come out of it, we bounce along, blah, 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 for a decade. And then the bottom falls out of the economy. We slowly dig ourselves out. Then we get injections and things are great for a couple of months. And then it goes down. But it goes down because it has to go down. Anybody here have children? A few of you. You have four, last I checked. So you've experienced this, the children grow very rapidly at certain stages in their life. If when they're four to five, they grow say three inches that year. If you extrapolate three inches a year, their whole life, you know, they'll be a 37 foot person by the time they're 40 years old. Extrapolation is a bad idea as a result, right? Things just happen. They go up, they go down. You can't grow forever. Things, you know, things, don't, things don't kill you. You recover from them. Our economy can't go up forever. It's not possible. It's coming down. Because after you take you know, some uppers, you have a downtime. You must remember this from college. I shouldn't have said that, but you get my point. I'm lying, I never did that stuff, right? Shrooms or whatever it is, there's an afterwards thing that's not so good. So this down thing, okay, would I like this down thing to have a, a shallower slope and go like this? Yes, that is a realistic ask at some level, but it's not what we got. We got what we got because that's what it is. But this in and of itself isn't so bad. It means our growth is declining. And here's, there it is. If all goes well, this year, GDP growth is 6%. I'm making up a number. It doesn't really matter. Maybe it's five and a half. We'll see. Next year, maybe three and a half. And the year after, two and a half or two. So think, five and a half, three and a half, two. Five and a half, six, maybe six, three and a half, two and a quarter. That's the story. GDP, whoo, because we can't sustain the highs we've been in because it's been artificial. Artificial savings, government spending, lockdown. And this is crazy stuff. Sugar high, it comes to an end. The high is followed by a low. The uppers are usually are followed by downers. Now, let's talk about the labor market. The labor market is crazy. It is absolutely crazy. We've never experienced anything like this in our lives. You're an old man. You've been through a lot of recessions. This recession is unlike any recession you've ever experienced. You've been through 14 recessions. Wow, that's very impressive. Yeah. I'd ask you your name, but you're probably too old and don't remember. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Okay. So look, this is the story. Right now, we have 10 million open jobs. 10 million jobs. I think you, Brad, you referred to that or Lawrence did or whatever. And we have 9 million unemployed Americans. Normally, in a good economy, you have a lot of job openings and no people who are unemployed, they're all working. In a bad economy of a lot of unemployed people and no job openings because no one's hiring. Now you have both at a very high level, completely unheard of. This is unheard of. This is crazy. It's because our economy, the demand side of the economy has recovered very rapidly, but the supply side hasn't been able to even come close to keeping up, not even close. So this is the story. We lose 22 and a half million jobs from peak to trough in two months. And to give you a feeling for how many jobs this is, the US economy in a good year produces 2 million jobs. So we lost in two months, 10 years of job growth, 10 years. So now people are bitching. Oh, the job market's not coming back so fast. Well, first of all, don't bitch. Doesn't do any good. And secondly, you're wrong. Let's go back and look at two recessions back. The dot-com bust. This is the peak employment. Look at the how many years it took for employment to return. It took a long friggin' time, right? Well, look at here. This is the housing bust. It took even longer here. That's a long friggin' time. And the job losses weren't that big here, and they weren't that big at all here. Just a little bit of job loss, right? Okay, here it's a lot more job loss. Here the job loss is immense. And in a year, we'll be back up there. Two and a half, three years, we'll completely recover from a huge monumental job loss. And people are bitching, it's not faster. 
This is totally impatient. Just, 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 just cool your chats. Just, just contain your enthusiasm, people. We're recovering really, really quickly. It's that demand has recovered much too quickly. The problem is the demand side, if you will. Supply is coming back. It's taking its time. It's much faster than normal. But demand is like totally out of control fast, right? Because of set for savings and the stimulus money, and we're locked in our friggin' houses with nothing to do. And now all we want to do, all we want to do is go to a rock concert. And I want to stand or surf the mosh pit at a Guns N' Roses concert. That's what I want to do, but I'm too afraid. <laughs> I'm too afraid, right? I, but this is the, that's the problem with, we're recovering pretty quickly. I mean, that's a very shallow, we've recovered already three quarters or more of the jobs. This is job growth. So we lose 20 million jobs, you know, there. And we get, we get back two and a half million, four and a half million. And then it goes down, 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 down until there. In December, things hit rock bottom. And you remember that President Trump signed the stimulus bill giving us all $600 checks then because COVID was raging. The third wave was really, really bad. 4,000 Americans a day were dying. It was really dire. It was cold. Everybody in the Northeast was staying home, heating their houses and killing each other, right? We in Florida were doing fine. We were outside partying and we were doing okay, but they were dying. We get our money and then we, get, we start getting vaccinated. And things improve. Better, 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 better. One bad month. Better, 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 better. Another bad month. This is the latest data. We were hoping to see jobs there gaining about 900,000, 800,000, 700,000. We got a quarter million instead. Economists like me were very upset. But hey, things happen. It happened back there in March or April, whatever it was. It happens from time to time. And there's COVID back with the Delta variant. So it's understandable why this happened. If you look at the composition of the jobs, you'll see uh, 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 leisure and hospitality. No friggin' job growth. What, that just happened? No, it's because of COVID, right? Now, the amazing thing is, despite the fact that the economy's number of people dying is as bad as it was a year ago, at the beginning, March, year and a half ago, right? Life is going on now. These successive waves have less and less economic impact each time because we've learned to deal with it. As individuals, we've learned to deal with it. As firms, we've learned to deal with it. As governments, we've learned to deal with it. We're struggling, we make mistakes, but generally speaking, we've learned how to deal with it better and better each time. There'll be another wave and it'll be less destructive than this wave because that's generally, unless it becomes, unless the wave, unless the new wave is, is resistant to the vaccines that we've received, right? And this is also good news. This is people, the first time claims for unemployment. So the proverbial pink slip, if you will. I'm letting you go. I'm, you know, you're losing your job. Involuntary separation is the technical term for it. So at its worst, it was 6 million. So here, in one week, we lose three years of jobs. And the next week, we lose three more weeks of jobs. I remember looking at this data and literally crying because I had just, you, you, you just can't imagine that you can lose 12, 12 and a half million jobs in two weeks. That's just, I mean, people's lives ruined, you know, all these terrible things happening. But then it gets better, 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 better until there, until there. And then it gets worse. And it goes up for like two months because that's Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, football, Super Bowl games, spreader event after spreader event after spreader event. COVID is raging. And then President Trump signs the lame duck session, $600. Then we get vaccinations and we're off to the races. But then it stops again. And then it gets better again. Economic data isn't beautiful, doesn't go up and down straight. There's head fakes and stutter steps and things go wrong. But if you look at the trend, we're almost back to normal here. We need this number to be below 300,000. The normal economy, our economy loses 300,000 jobs a week. 300,000 jobs a week is 1.3 million jobs a month. We create 1.5 million jobs a month in a normal economy, not now post COVID, right? So if we create 1.5 and we lose 1.3, we're net 200,000, 180,000, whatever. And that gets us roughly 2 million jobs a year. Right now, we're at 340,000. We're 40,000 jobs away from me declaring this part of the labor market recovered. This is a remarkably quick recovery. The labor market continues to improve. It's not as fast as I'd like. I'd like it to go faster, but it is what it is, right? This is okay. The problem is this. This is our problem. The labor force has shrunk. 
The labor force is shrunk for a number of reasons. The labor force is shrunk because people who are 62, 63, 64, 65 have retired. They can get early social. They used to fold pants at the gap. They could fold pants faster. At the Olympics, pants folding, they win the competition every year. But then that job is gone. Now no one goes to the gap to buy pants. They're unemployed all of a sudden, right? They, and they quit. Or they have a job like they're, they're a manicurist. Imagine that, you're a manicurist. What kind of job is this? All day long, people sit close to you and they go like this. They go, all day long. <laughs> you know, I'm out of here, man. I'm done. I'm done. So you quit. So you lose a few million people because of retirement. Then people who used to work in hospitality, they get fired from their job. They get fired from their job. What do they do? They discover, I'm going to change careers. I don't want to work like a farm animal anymore. I want to have a new career. They try new things. The kids, you have octuplets. You can't get a job. You can't work because you have kids. So all these problems are pervasive, right? Um, education saves a day. And this is what's important to you guys. College, some college, high school, no high school. These people, oddly enough, are in short supply right now. First, because more and more people get college degrees. There are fewer and fewer people who don't have a college degree. And they all lost their jobs last March, April, May. Now they're being called back. And what are they doing? They're going to their employer and going, I used to have another career. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm going to change my career. I'm taking Abraham Maslow's ladder, and I'm climbing up a couple rungs on Abraham Maslow's ladder. Thank you very much. I don't like being treated like a farm animal and getting paid like crap. But if you look at job payment, wage growth, same person, 12 months apart, you don't see much wage pressure because doctors, they're not getting pay raises. Lawyers, accountants, economists, they weren't fired. They're not in short supply. It's low wage workers that are getting extra money and they don't make a lot of money. So if they get paid a little extra spread across the economy, it's not gonna do a lot for inflation. So I don't see wage inflation being bad. Now, inflation is here. There's no doubt about it. Look at this. This is the Fed's favorite measure of inflation, not CPI, but PCE. Red is core, no food and energy. This is food and energy, all right? Now I'm gonna pick a bone here with, with Lawrence. I think Lawrence is dead wrong on his inflation call. He said they're gonna raise rates next year two, three or four times each a quarter point. He's wrong. There's no way they're gonna do it. And here's why. The inflation that we're seeing on the slide that he showed is very contained to a few areas of the economy. Cars, used cars, new cars, and rental cars. There's massive inflation there. When you have just small areas of inflation, you're not gonna, that's not broad-based. It's not going to happen. People say, look, how about the money supply? It's really going up a lot. It's true, it's going up a lot, but that's not gonna cause inflation. Why not? Because the money velocity has dropped like a rock. No one, no one's spending the money they have. Banks aren't making loans against the money that they have. And last but not least, this is how much our economy is producing now in income, job, income, wages, bonuses, dividends, interest, and royalties. That's how much it was before the recession began. So this is no government assistance here of any kind, right? This is not gonna drive inflation because there's not enough money in the system to do it. And the forced savings is going to go away. I'm almost finished. You're gonna have to bear with me. Should I go a little bit longer? What do you say? Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The, 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 the people have spoken. Um, two minutes, I'm almost done, I am. This is inflation expectations. They're not all that high. Inflation's not, people don't expect inflation. They see it's inflations in a few areas that are really weird and they're gonna come down. Demand will fall as, as people don't need stuff anymore, as it gets sated. So bottleneck supply chain bottlenecks will eventually go away, whether it's six months, nine months, 12 months or more, they'll go away. Inflation over the last four months has steadily declined month over month. It's still high at 3%, but it was four and a half and it's steadily declining. Oil prices are up in car prices. That's not economy-wide inflation. I just don't see it. And moreover, don't pay attention to Wall Street. They're idiots. They know nothing, nothing. This is the federal funds rate. It was zero. It never went up from here to there. It never rose. But Wall Street that up, 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 up. Oh, it goes up finally. A broken clock works once a day too, right? So don't look at them. So what's the Fed going to do? 
the Fed will do nothing. The Fed's told us Fed funds is going to go nowhere until maybe the earliest end of 22, I think early 23. This is still over a year away. We don't have inflation will be going down, not fast enough, but it will be going down. GDP is going to be delicately falling over the next couple of years too. How on earth can you get the treasury going up much? It goes from 1.6 to 1.7 to 1. Maybe it's two, but we're not going to have much inflation because it's secularly declining. GDP growth is going down. I just don't see it. Now, the only catch, rents. Rents, housing. Now, the catch here is rents are 30% of CPI and 20% of the, per, the, the, per, the, per, the PCE, the Fed's favorite measure of inflation. If rents go up and continue to rise, we're a little screwed because that will drive the inflation numbers up and the Fed may be forced to raise rates before they want to. So watch rents really, really, really closely. Another measure of rents, another measure of rents. They're all going up. Two more slides and we're done. First, if you don't know where you live, I have an arrow over Florida. Florida's okay. It's a little weaker because of, of tourism and travel, right? You're a little weaker. But it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. This is immigration. 2018, Florida was 13th best. 55.6% of people moving were moving into the state as opposed to the other 43.6%. Then in 2019, it went up to seventh. People keep moving to Florida. You have great weather, cheap housing, and low taxes. It's the magic trip that you need those three things to attract people, and you've got it in droves. In 2020, it went back to nine through seven, but it's still really good. So people keep moving to Florida, and where do they move? So there's different color arrows. The, 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 or, the dark arrows are nearby. The red are nearby. Tampa, Sarasota, and Fort Myers, all nearby. Then there's the Orlando complex of Lakeland, Orlando, Daytona, and Melbourne. Seven cities in Florida in the top 15. Florida is a magnet for growth, the friggin' magnet. And the long run, where are people moving in the East Coast? The Carolinas, Georgia, Florida, Texas, and then in the Intermountain West. We have the luck of living in Florida. It's now, this is the overall. 21 is going to be a good year. 22 will be a good year above trend growth. The Fed won't raise rates until the earliest a year from now. The earliest. We'll create millions of jobs. Inflation should not be a problem with the exception of rents. Follow them closely. Spending on services will rise and housing will become less push as a result. My name is Elliot Eisenberg. I put out 70 words every day on the economy. No graphs, no ads, no charts, no links, no photos. Thank you. Thank you. Sign up. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I took too long. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa.